Greetings, uh, everyone, and welcome uh, to this uh, really uh, uh, special, special uh, time this afternoon. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Let me just add, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, ICAD USA, and the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. Sponsors for today, for today's program are the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network, Friends of Tenth of Nations, North America, and the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. Co-sponsors, those are the Center for Jewish Nonviolence, Jewish Voice for Peace Atlanta, the Olive Oil Ministry, United Church of Christ, Palestine Israel Network, ICAD USA, United Methodist Kairos Response, Voices from the Holy Land, and In His Steps, Pathways of Peace. Bill Plitt is known throughout the activist world for Palestinian rights as one of the co-founders of Friends of Tenth of Nations North America. He's also been active in the Presbyterian Church in various leadership roles, including serving as vice moderator of the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the PCUSA. But most of all, it's Bill's humility, generosity of spirit, extraordinary kindness, and his deep faith in the beauty of diversity, the creativity of the human spirit, and then the possibility of reconciliation based in the power of the gospel that has made him a friend of many throughout the world. Bill, uh, you wanted to open uh, with uh, a prayer for us all. And so would you please do that and lead us? Yes, uh, greetings to all of you. It's like a walk back in, in my time, in my history to see all so many good friends. And while my book is uh, my, my story, it is our, it is our book. Uh, and many of you have been a part of that. I also want to take time to thank Michael for inviting me to speak with you this afternoon. Uh, he's a wonderful friend and we've walked side by side in some of the uh, touring events throughout the country and a uh, good friend. And uh, I'm uh, looking forward to his questions. And uh, I, my hope is that when you leave this meeting today, that each of you will be in touch with your stories because those are authentic experiences that make us who we are. We are humankind, aren't we? Um, I'm gonna offer a prayer, a spontaneous prayer to begin us uh, and to pull us together. Um, oh, merciful God, we are grateful for your presence at this moment in time as we bond together as people of faith. We thank you for the stories of all who have gathered here, for those who've come and seen and gone back to their communities and shared their story. We thank you for this moment. We pray that each of us will take away something of tremendous ongoing value. In these, in these things we pray, oh God, amen. Amen, and thank you so much, Bill. So today we're going to be discussing uh, your book, Stories I Never Knew, um, Acts of Loving Kindness, and it's the struggle for human rights and dignity in the occupied Palestinian territories and Israel. And as I showed you before, Bill, my, my uh, book is dog-eared. And those uh, who will be reading your book, purchasing it, reading it, will find theirs to be dog-eared as well. And there you go. Okay. Well, you're ready with your notes for the day. So let's get <laughs> it. Let's get at it. Uh, so, Bill, welcome. Um, Thank you, Mike. I, I want to get into your book. But, uh, of course, all of us on the screen, right, are concerned, still concerned about Daoud and Dar Nasar after being brutally attacked two weekends ago. I know people have a lot of questions and they can receive updates from the Friends of Tenth of Nations North America website, but what can you tell us now? 
Yes, I, I tried to reach Daoud about uh, um, a half hour ago, and he was emailing me on uh, WhatsApp at the same time. <laughs> That's an unanticipated possibility. Um, as you know, uh, it was a brutal attack, and I won't go into the details, but I suggest that if you want an up-to-date uh, account of where things are as much as we know, um, you can go to the Photana website and, and, uh, and go in there and you'll find the latest. Um, when I talked with Dawood uh, this morning, his, um, his voice was the same as, uh, as all of us who've been there remember. And his words that he agreed that, that I should share is that he's ordered 150 olive trees and people are coming from all over the area of the region to help plant in the next coming weeks. There is the hope. You know, there is the magic of that little farm and its simple message of refusing to be enemies. And they're, uh, they've reco they're recovering from their wounds uh, and uh, they're back in their homes and back at work. Thank you. Uh, that's, I'm asking. No, I, yes, that I is true. Read the chat, but I didn't put in the chat. Okay, good. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Let me get you back on the screen here. Okay. All righty. Um, I want to go back to the origins, Bill, um, about your uh, Palestinian activism. Um, you begin your book with a story about a turning point for you and your engagement with Palestine. Thursday, September 13th, 2001, a young Palestinian girl from Bethlehem in your class and the exchange you had with her. Tell us about it. Yes. Um, we all know where we were that day, don't we? Uh, in those days uh, in our life, uh, eye-opener, startling. And uh, I went in the third day because we had a day off. I went into school and to set up the room, get ready for the conversations with uh, the kids. And the school I was teaching in was a very multicultural uh, uh, school and uh, student body. There was a student in the back of the room. Uh, uh, she was in her hijab, and uh, her um, she uh, had taken a couple of courses with me, and uh, a very good student, and uh, came forth to me and said, um, "I'm sorry about the loss of your people in New York, uh, in the fields of Pennsylvania, and at the Pentagon, but maybe now." people will begin to realize what Palestinians face every day. I was struck by that. Um, I was a historian, I studied history. Uh, I wasn't sure just what she was saying. Uh, and four years later or three years later, I found myself at uh, the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church hearing Mark Braverman and a colleague speak about their experiences. And I recalled the student's message then, which meant even more once I got to uh, Israel-Palestine on a two-week trip on both sides of the, of, the, of the wall, did I really understand what she meant. And it, I, I wonder today, and I think I mentioned something towards the end of my book, I said to her, I hope now I've told your story. I think one of the things I've learned in teaching, good teachers that I've copied, uh, learn as they're teaching. And that certainly was an occasion for me. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. I still want to talk about some of the influences that shaped you. Uh, in your introduction, you referenced being a Peace Corps volunteer in Belize in 1964 to 66 and you're teaching at Cordoza High School in Washington, D.C. as part of the Cordoza Project in Urban Teaching. Tell us about both of these, your time in Belize and at Cordoza, and also how they prepared you for your advocacy work for Palestinian rights. Wow. 
Yes, uh, two uh, remarkable times in my life. The first, in order, chronologically, was going to the Peace Corps. I had um, I was attending the University of Maryland undergraduate at the time and uh, heard uh, John F. Kennedy's speech about a call to, to action, not what we do for ourselves, but what we do for our country. And that was sort of in the back of my background. And, uh, and uh, when I was assigned it initially to Bolivia, but I was switched the last moment and found myself in a small country of what was called then British Honduras. Uh, and I was, uh, uh, I was prepared to do community development work in the rural villages to help build a sense of community, but they needed someone with a liberal arts background. And uh, because I suddenly was thrust in a role two days later as a teacher, which is not part of my plan. <laughs> uh, and so after 15 <laughs> years in education, I, that certainly was a beginning for me. Um, and I, I think uh, it was my first time away uh, to another place, to another culture. And I was fortunate to live with a family. Uh, many volunteers were either isolated in rural areas. Some of you I know are Peace Corps volunteers, or former volunteers, and uh, know the experience. Uh, I was fortunate to be in the city and also uh, um, at a school uh, uh, nearby. And, uh, and the family I lived with, I still communicate with 55 years later. Wow. The children were two children in the family. One was four when I got there. I was six. It, it, it was, he was six when I left. And a 15-year-old who was 17 when I left. Been in touch with them both. And they're just a few years younger than I am. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> But uh, still in touch after all these years and uh, a member of a family. So I think that de in-depth experience in the culture uh, was something that uh, I saw it when I went to Israel-Palestine, particularly when I was on solo. And I went a lot of times by myself on buses and, and various vehicles uh, because I know that when I've traveled in the past, when you are alone, people tend to gravitate and you, you see a side of the culture that you wouldn't have seen in the group. Yeah. It was risky sometimes, but I never felt threatened any time. So those are two things about the Peace Corps experience that I've carried on with me. Uh, it also started a community that uh, of friends that I still have after all those years, and some of them are on this uh, call today. And some of my former students are here too. It was really um, uh, exciting. Uh, when I came back, I really wanted to learn to teach because I hadn't had all the methodology courses that I thought you needed to be a good teacher. And so uh, I was fortunate that Bobby Kennedy has uh, initiated a program called the uh, Teacher Corps um, and, and uh, a project, uh, a pilot program uh, called the Cardoza Project in Urban Teaching. And uh, in that situation, uh, in that as you, as you were an intern, you were required to be working towards a graduate degree in education. And at the time, it was at Howard University. So I, I attended uh, courses that were given in the school where I was teaching at Cardoza High School there in D.C. Some of you know that area. Um, and um, I, um, I learned, I had a, a mentor who's you know, on this call, no doubt, who uh, demonstrated to me what I wanted to be as a teacher and that was uh, engaged with students on a uh, uh, student-based instruction and inquiry learning from that very beginning and that that experience uh, was the underpinning of my approach of philosophy and education all the way through and training teachers as well and then returning back to the classroom after nearly 35 years of teaching. That was the best time I've ever had until now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the Cardozo Project became the pilot program for the National Teacher Corps. And that was unfortunately in the mid seventies wiped out by the administration. Unfortunately, uh, because it was one of the best vehicles for reaching uh, the students who, uh, uh, who were, uh, underserved, let's say. 
Yeah. Uh, so those are, does that respond to your question, Mike? Yes, that's wonderful. Thanks so much, Bill. Throughout your book, uh, you speak about unanticipated moments. That's what, that's what you call them, what we might call moments of grace. One of the unanticipated moments you refer to is you and your sister selling the family farm in North Carolina, where you'd spent uh, so many summers as a boy, and how that prepared you three years later for your meeting with the Nassar family on their farm. So two things, Bill. Tell us more about that connection between your experience as a young boy and teenager on the farm and your meeting with Daoud and his family. And second, say a word about what you understand by unanticipated moments, your personal theology, if you will, of unanticipated moments. Okay. So my attachment to the land and then those surprises along the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. Good. Those are good, uh, good questions. Um, I, I certainly, uh, I, I visited our family farm as a young boy and spent time during the summers there. And um, this is back in the uh, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, and um, I, I guess I felt a connection to the land that I don't know that I would have had as someone living in a city or urban life and see the connection between the land, its fruits and our sustenance. Uh, I learned the, uh, the meaning of hard work and labor and, and, uh, and also pain and suffering because farmers were struggling during those years and times. Uh, I also saw my mother's roots. Uh, as I mentioned in my, mm -hmm my acknowledgement, uh, dedication of the book, uh, Kay and I dedicated uh, the book to our mothers and my aunt who largely raised me also was a part of, it was my, one of my teachers. Um, and Kay mentioned her mother who was a mother to seven girls because she lost, Kay lost her father when she was five, three years old. So this amazing woman raised seven wonderful women, one of which I happened to marry. And uh, I'm glad I did. <laughs> the, uh, and I didn't mention that part of the Peace Corps. There are some people who knew me before I married Kay and how wonderful she's been in uh, not only editing my book, but my life in lots of ways. It made me a better, better person. Um, so the... So that was so. When I got to the farm, I, I let me step back um, because of uh, the encroachment of uh, the city near our farm. We were being pressured, unfortunately, like a lot of small family farms, to uh, to sell the land. And uh, I made efforts to try to to uh, like give it to a conservatory, but we weren't able to do that. Um, so I sold the land for, and. Uh, we were able to put low cap cost housing as a requirement. So that was a gift from my grandmother and, uh, and my grandfather for the community there. Um, so uh, when I went to the land, one of the things we did in our interfaith peace builder trip was to plant to uh, harvest olives. We were the first uh, olive harvest uh, group in the interfaith peace builder program. And, uh, so when you touch the land yourself, you are already, some of you have been to the farm and planted it, no doubt, and you, you know that feeling of the attachment to the, to the land and how important land is to the Palestinian people, especially now, and how important it is uh, as a place where people can come and also contribute their labor to building a future through the olive tree planting and other things. Um, so the question, the other question had to do with uh, in the um, unanticipated moments. Unanticipated, yeah, unanticipated possibilities is the phrase yeah. I always use. And uh, I got that from the, uh, uh, the um, I had to go back and look at his name quickly. Um, the uh, um, rapporteur of uh, 
for the United Nations. Uh, his name was Richard Falk. And I remember him talking to us one time and, uh, and describing uh, the uh, Palestine-Israel situation or the conflict as it was phrased or termed or described for many years before I went there. And he said, this is not a conflict. As many of you know, you would say this too. It was a new learning for me at the time. It's a struggle for human rights and dignity. And like all of those periods of our history, it's a grassroots movement of which all of you are on this with me and others together. And will and will be resolved uh, in a sense of and the flavor of unanticipated possibilities, which I think is a creative space for us to work and keep in mind that there's no easy solution. It's about a process. Um, and then some of the examples of that, I think I would just talk about in a macro way, just going and seeing and hearing a narrative I had never known growing up. I lived in a Jewish community in Baltimore. My mother went trained at Sinai Hospital. We celebrated Shabbat with her friends and colleagues. Uh, I worked for a, a, a businessman who happened to be Jewish. I went to a 40% uh, Jewish high school in Baltimore, on and on. Uh, so I, I thought I knew the story. I remember also when I was in uh, elementary school uh, or in a church uh, Sunday school, we had these small containers and you put a dime or so or a penny in uh, and those, those, that money went to build, to, to plant trees in Israel, you know, so I was rooted deeply. As a matter of fact, on my first trip there, I was kind of looking for that tree. I didn't see it. <laughs> I'm sure it was there. Uh, so, so that's the, in the larger sense. And then um, what, what I really sensed during my 15 years and I don't, more than, I don't remember how many times I've been there, but, but um, there was, I was searching certainly for places where I would find light. I, I knew about the darkness pretty quickly in that first year. And I wanted to find people who were working for harmony and justice. And so I, I looked, my lenses were different than they were on my first trip. And so almost everything that I saw and of the 46 uh, stories that I have in our book, our book and my story, uh, there are glimpses of hope, hope. And out of that experience, I developed this sense, it may have been there through wonderfully compassionate parents, uh, through friends earlier on, but I look for moments of kindness. Uh, and those were the unanticipated possibilities. I want to uh, ask you about uh, this time that you uh, referred to, kind of the origins uh, uh, with uh, Ten of Nations. You know, many of us on this call have been there. We love Daoud and his family. We uh, support uh, the ministry there uh, financially and with prayer and other ways. We planted trees there and volunteered. But mo most of us on the screen have other ministries that uh, uh, we support as well. And, and I know that's true about you too, but I guess what I want you to flesh out a little bit more for us, Bill, is what was it about Daoud and his family on the farm that stirred your spirit and Mark Braverman and Bill Mims and others that you actually started an organization. I mean, it's nationwide now and, and really uh, uh, is very active and very responsive to the needs of the farm. You took that extra step and started a whole organization to support their work there. Can you flesh out a little bit more what was so special about that ministry that you wanted to give your life to, to it? Yes, and I would say to all of the friends of Tent of Nations, there are many of you on the screen that I'm looking at right now have been to the farm and think of your own story and, and how it impacted your life, maybe not to the point that Mark and Bill and I went to eventually, but, but in some way it, it affected you indirectly or directly 
and 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 I'm not sure that my reasons for uh, wanting to uh, to share the story I had heard that time uh, is unique. It happened to be a perfect storm. Um, Mark had been to the farm uh, in a delegation uh, just before ours, and Bill and I traveled together, not knowing each other, but met each other through the experience. Um, we had uh, an incredible uh, tour uh, and went on both sides of the wall. We stayed in people's homes. I know that you've done that too. We, hollowed, we uh, harvested olives in Janine and in uh, Bethlehem area. Um, uh, it was an immersion into the culture and that was transforming in itself. And uh, interestingly enough, the, the visit to Tent of Nations was one of the last places we went to. Uh, and after uh, adapt, uh, adapting to the, uh, the time changes and the uh, sleepy days, <laughs> We, uh, and, and the listening to some incredibly rich stories of people working under great pressures and doing wonderful things uh, to maintain a sense of humanity. Uh, and the last one was, uh, when I say two days before we left, I can remember walking up the field, the, uh, the road, as you, many of you did have done, I see you're shaking your heads, and, and pass through the barricade that was set up in 2004. And, uh, for us, uh, we could look up on the top of that hill and you could see people just running around and some people in trees and people coming out of the caves, no doubt, hearing the story of the family. Uh, and this was unique. And here we're standing on this hill. And those of you who have been there will remember this too. Uh, the whole uh, two week experience and exposure to a new narrative was right before us at 3,000 feet, yeah. surrounded by five settlements, and uh, and, and you got the you got the the picture. It was a, a, an incredible experience to begin to put together what we had uh, what we had seen, and we stayed the night. And it was cold in November. I mean, we were we were in the tents of nations. <laughs> Those things that were canvas. Some of you had that same experience. And we sat around the fire, uh, we sang songs, uh, we ate uh, out the, in the open fire there. Uh, winds were blowing, I don't know, 30, 35 miles an hour. It was really cold. And uh, we had, the whole family was there, at least Owen's family was there. So the children were there. Uh, I remember reading stories to uh, um, Bashar, who was two years at, at the time, and, and Nardine and Shadin, uh so wonderful and the family is so joyful and not one word of victimization not one word of demonization uh and that was you know that was not that was a new message for us yeah and so when we went back and it took a while to pull it together but we said i think mark said or bill said you know this is a this is a good fight and uh, that's what launched it. And then the relationship over the last 15 years with the family and with lots of friends of Tenth of Nations and our work together in the churches uh, has been my life. And I had 45 years of teaching, active teaching. And I was fortunate to have a, a, an incredibly rich experience. But the last 15 years of my life have been even richer at times. Well, uh, you know, thanks for that, Bill. Uh, I, I could see on the screen as I was scrolling through how, how your experience touched many of us here on this call. So thanks for sharing so personally about that. You know, one of the most moving uh, parts of Daoud's story, and of course there are many, including we refuse to be enemies, but, you know, they're not allowed to have electricity, so they install solar panels. They're not allowed to dig wells, so they... They collect rainwater. Uh, they're not allowed to build buildings, so they use caves. Over the years, Friends of Tents of Nations has been instrumental in supporting these projects and others. Pick a couple of the projects over the last 15 years that were the most meaningful for you, Bill. Wow. Um, 
Good. Well, what comes to mind is the women's center that Jihan uh, initiated in the Muslim village of Nahalim, which is down below, as you know. And, uh, and uh, she began by offering courses in uh, um, English. And these are women primarily who were at home in traditional Muslim communities there. Uh, were not schooled past a certain age, uh, grade level because they had family responsibilities. And uh, they uh, began to come to the center. Uh, and we did through our uh, fundraising efforts, which was, by the way, not our key goal or strategy. Uh, the strategy really was to convey the simple idea of refusing to be enemies and loving your neighbor. And if you, if you bought into that simple message, then we welcomed support. And, and I think we never, ever had a lack of funds or support for that reason, I think. Um, so the Women's Project grew um, over the years. And my wife Kay worked with Jihan to develop cookbooks uh, women's faith, their favorite recipes of their families, uh, poetry, uh, poetry of uh, what their stories were. Uh, and there was, were the gifts that we gave to people when we traveled. And to see uh, the, um, the challenge, you might have thought there'd be a great distance between this village because of their faith and, and, and the and the Nasars being uh, Christians, uh, but there was there was a, a a great understanding there, great possibilities. Mm. So that was that was one of them. I would say it was an outstanding event because it was something everyone could buy into here in yeah. this country, and as well as the community there. Uh, another one would be. Uh, and some of you were part of this in 2014. I was uh, with Daoud in the uh, Seattle area, and uh, we had uh, got news from Jahan that the army had come in in the middle of the night and uh, bulldozed uh, 1,500 trees in the valley. Uh, and that was startling uh, and certainly uh, frightening. And Dawood and I, um, fortunately, were uh, already, uh, as a part of our itinerary out there, to join uh, a CMEP uh, webinar. And some of you were on that webinar. There were over 125 people, mostly church leaders, because that was the group that uh, CMEP was focusing on at that time. So it was a chance to spread the word about what had happened. Uh, and the response was uh, it was awesome. Let me ask you about that a little bit more. That was actually going to be my next question. Okay. May 19th, 2014 uh, uh, was the date. Um, in your conversation, this, this is what you relate in your book, Bill. In your conversation, Dawood asked, what was the bulldozer driver thinking as he plowed down those mature trees? What did the bulldozer driver tell his daughter about what he did at work that day. And then he said to you, you must make the trees and plants like humans. And then you wrote a steadfast witness and it really spread throughout the country. All of us in the activist world for Palestinian rights know about a steadfast witness and how we shared that among our various organizations. Say a little bit about that part of this uh, experience. Yes. Uh, as I was saying earlier, the, when we just got the phone call from Jahan about the destruction, uh, we, we were to go into a classroom at Seattle Pacific University, an English class, three English classes, and we said, what can we tell people? You know, what, what is our message? And... Um, you know, is it a message of hope? Is this, what, what should we say? And it's there in the coffee house on the campus there. Dawood and I were sitting and 
these words, the first thing that came out of Dao's uh, mouth was, what was the bulldozer driver thinking? And, and, the, and the words and, and the, uh, the descriptions that Mike just read became part of a poem at the end of the poem, actually. Um, um, so um, called the steadfast witness. And what that was, was that of all the 1500 trees, there was one tree that stood alone. It was a fig tree. And, uh, and uh, so it became the witness uh, for that experience. Um, I want to take you, uh, thanks for that, Bill, that we, we who have known you and known Daoud and Tent of Nations for these many years, remember that incident uh, very clearly uh, seared into our memories. And your writing and Daoud's response and the family's response remain a model, uh, remain a witness to us all. So thanks for sharing that a little bit more, uh, the particulars. You've had other travels uh, in Israel and Palestine. One of the places you visited many times and about which you write in your book and in your articles in the Christian Century and in your blog is the Palestinian village Miser and the Kibbutz Metzer. Uh, you've been there many times. Uh, tell us about them and their leaders, Badia Rakia and Dov Avital. Mm -hmm. And why this place, this the, your visits there, and and their relationship uh, means so much to you. Thank you, Mike. That's a good question. Um, I have to acknowledge uh, one person, uh, uh, Christy Reiners, who's in on the call, and also is wrote the very thoughtful uh, uh, foreword for our book. I, I'm grateful yes, for that. Yes, you did. Mm -hmm. and, um, Absolutely. And she was in, a grassroots person. She was in the villages and working on women's issues as well as health issues. Christy and is a force of nature in her own right, is she not? She is, is <laughs> that. And uh, I, uh, she would put me on to places that I wanted to go to that I hadn't been for before. So I'm grateful. Some of those places we went together, but many I went alone. And um, she mentioned this uh, one place, Bill Mims uh, on our team uh, uh, was also with me. We went to this uh, kibbutz and heard the story there um, of the kibbutz uh, and, uh, and its uh, neighboring village. Uh, it seems that, and very briefly, because you could read it in the book, but very briefly, uh, it was a place where uh, uh, in 1952, uh, Argentinian immigrants, immigrants came uh, to start a kibbutz. And they were young uh, urban folks and, um, uh, and set down their place right next to this village, Meister uh, village. And, uh, and uh, with the Arab leaders there, and they said, um, we know the, the uh, we know that uh, we're supposed to be fighting each other, but uh, let's see what we can do otherwise. And uh, that relationship began and has grown over the years. And uh, I was struck by uh, the, the events where there was a uh, real understanding. As a matter of fact, in general, even in, in 2006, there was still communication amongst people of, of different cultures. Um, unfortunately, the occupation deeply affected those experiences, but people had memories of, of collaborative times, uh, of times of mutual sharing of social moments. But I guess uh, one incident that said a lot to me that made me want to come back was uh, in 2002, I believe, um, a, what's described as a Palestinian nationalist broke onto the farm uh, and, uh, and to the kibbutz and uh, shot and killed the general secretary and two children. And it, the wave, of course, went all throughout uh, Israel because of the horror of it. A week later, um, I can't remember the name, the, the word. In, when you come and sit for uh, uh, someone who's lost someone and Palestinians came and celebrated the life of those, that family 
with the people of the kibbutz and uh, and uh, as a as a symbol of solidarity and spiritual sense. Uh, we only have maybe an hour to hear the stories of the kibbutz, and uh, I wanted to go back, uh, and so I went back again uh, two years, a year or two later. And met with Dov Abato, who's a general uh, secretary, is, was a general secretary, secretary general of the kibbutz. And I saw what they were doing. Uh, they had their own high school. They had uh, industrial, uh, state-of-the-art industrial uh, manufacturing of water filters. You know, the, 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 Israel's, the Israelis are known for their water uh, uh, research and, and uh, productivity. Um, and uh, uh, some 300 herd of, of uh, Jersey cows that uh, produce non low fat milk, and uh, you know just doing amazing things, and uh, and then talked about the times during the last 20 years of sharing where they shared the same ball um, soccer field, they uh, they had uh, a restaurant nearby that they all still uh, shared food and and social events with. Um, and I said at the end of that session, I said, Dov, this has been really wonderful, and what you're doing is amazing, and, um, and I'm glad that you have this relationship, but I'm only here on one side of this. Uh, do, you, do you think that I could come back next year and meet with the village council? He said, I'll make that happen. So that I came back a third time, and, uh, and I took my notes from my recorder. I was ready to get all the truth and all the details. And after about three or four minutes, I threw my book out and I put my, <laughs> my tape recorder away because I, what I was hearing was authentic stories of their parents and, and the children and families really coming together. Um, one of the things I'd heard earlier on in 2006 was, or yeah, 2007 actually, um, that, um, the, the first thing the, uh, the people in the kibbutz needed was a good, uh, w good water, uh, potable water. And, uh, and the Arab uh, uh, leader of the community said, well, we have a small well, but we'd be glad to share it with you. And so going forward, um, um, after about four hours, it was supposed to only be an hour, after about four hours of eating wonderful uh, sweets and, and drinking coffee, of course. Um, before we left, he, they took me out to um, a, uh, the well and um, the, the kibbutz refused to use the water from the, 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 uh, from the uh, authority, um, Israeli authority, because it didn't taste good. But the, the original well that was shared so many years before was in, in fact shared and they showed me where the two faucets were uh, from the well before I left. That wow. said volumes to me about the the, uh, the sense of uh, of, of uh, understanding. And some people might describe this moment as a normalization, and certainly there is that danger of that. But the fact that they really work at uh, and go out on the edge of being. Uh, members of the same community uh, uh, led me not to make that identification. You know, uh, um, it's one of those unanticipated possibilities meeting these people and you share so many of these stories in your book. Um, let me ask you about one more. And that is this, this moment of grace, this uh, unanticipated possibility in Jackson, Mississippi, where you and Daoud met John Perkins. Tell us that story. Well, many of you know John Perkins. I didn't know him or what he had done. Uh, he had witnessed the tragic uh, death of his uh, son, his brother, actually. And, um, and we were uh, led to this. Uh, we went from Lansing, Michigan, speaking at your, your <laughs> Lansing, yeah. Michigan, right? No, Wisconsin. <laughs> and, uh, Lansing, Michigan. Yeah, Lansing, Michigan. In Michigan. We were at the university campus, and the next morning we we're, were in Jackson, Mississippi. You know, it's a real switch in, in uh, format and cultures for sure. 
and um, um, we uh, were able to go through the graces of Telos, another partner in this wonderful journey uh, with us uh, to meet John Perkins. And uh, he is, uh, he at the time was a very active uh, community worker all his life and um, has started a community health program, a whole lot of programs to support uh, the people of, the, of Jackson. And uh, uh, we waited outside the house and uh, his, uh, his aide uh, came to us. He was uh, a man, uh, you know, you, you know when you're in the presence of somebody truly great, you know, there's this sense of awe, sense of, sense of humility uh, and quietness that was uh, very attractive. Uh, and I remember that time. There were four of us in a room. We sat on a square table. Um, there was uh, uh, John on one side and Dowd on the other side, and then my counterpart uh, on the other side of the table. We're sitting there, and the first thing that uh, John said to Dowd, he said, you know, uh, you had it a lot worse than we did. We had our land. We had land. Wow. And um, it was a it was a magical moment at decoration, and and understanding of what Dalu was experiencing along with his family and many Palestinians. You said that I mean you kind of indicated that they had just met, and yet it was as if they had known each other forever. Yes, I mean they they just connected in some transcendent way. Yes, I, I, that's well said, uh, Mike. I think that was what I was trying to describe in the word awe. There was a mutual yeah. mutuality, a, mu a connection to the land yeah. uh, and its importance. So, yes. Let me uh, um, move on a little bit. In addition to your work with Friends in Tent to Nations North America, <laughs> You've served in various capacities within your local congregation, the PCUSA, and in the Israel-Palestine Mission Network. And I just want to say, you know, for I, I've been a member of the UCC PIN from the beginning, uh, but uh, IPMN. I'm going to I'm going to ask you all to please mute your screens, please. Thank you. Um, Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church has always been a pioneer. And, and led the way for many years for uh, Palestinian advocacy. And so I just want to acknowledge that uh, uh, our, all of our debts uh, to Israel-Palestine Mission Network. I mean, we're, the rest of us are, are hopefully have caught up a little bit, but uh, we want to acknowledge their work in, in the early days. In, in your brief bio at the end of your book, you mentioned that one of the highlights was witnessing the adoption of the Belhar Confession in 2016. So this is a large question, pick and choose whatever you want to answer, but highlights with your work of IPMN, PCSO, PCUSA, the adoption of Belhar, where, where would you like to enter into that question to answer? Wow, that's a- uh... Yeah, that's a large one. <laughs> um, and they're all integrated, you know, of course. Yeah, I, I, that's why I asked them together. Uh, you're so wise, Mike, you are so wise. Um, <laughs> Let me say that um, through a friend uh, on this call, and I'm hesitant to mention a couple of friends, uh, I was introduced, uh, I think on my second trip, which was, I wanted to go back and see the Holy Land from a tourist point of view, but I, was, I got a nice mix of, uh, of the uh, other side of the wall as well, and traveled with a very small group of people who uh, to this day, I'm still good friends with. Let's see you out there. Uh, and um, when we uh, came back, one of the requirements for or, or opportunities for that second trip was, which was the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship sponsored trip, Advent trip. And it was also a, um, a, an eye opening experience. And uh, I uh, remembered that in the application for that delegation, you had to, uh, you were offered the opportunity to uh, 
uh, um, become a, or you know, not become, but apply to be a, a uh, uh, commissioner to the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. And I didn't know very much about that other than my Presbyterian, my own church, but a much bigger church in some ways. And uh, so I did, and then I came back. Uh, I, I think it was a good thing, but I was uh, selected as a commissioner uh, to 2008. So I went to San Jose and uh, I met the, the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship folk, as well as the Interfaith Peace Builders, was nudged along by a colleague uh, to get involved in this. And, uh, and there was another wonderful uh, group of people uh, equally dedicated uh, and who shared a common path, a journey. And I'm grateful for both of those organizations as well as, as some of the others that are mentioned as sponsors here. Every one of those I've had some contact with, um, maybe at a minimal level, but have been affected by uh, the community that has been woven over the years of folks like you. Um, I'm grateful. Um, and I, I, as an educator, I was interested in curriculum and for my first three or four years working in my own home church who embraced me in spite of who I was and uh, was able to work in churches in my Presbyterian teaching using the said past hope materials, which were some of the early materials that uh, the um, uh, Israel Palestine Mission Network developed to, together. And so uh, it was a tool that I could go and use in, in my teaching. Um, and then as a, as a leader in the presbytery, which is again an unanticipated possibility, I had no idea that I would be leading the, the presbytery at least for two, two years it turned out to be. And, and one of the things that happens is that you were, uh, you went as a commissioner to the General Assembly. And so to be uh, at that General Assembly in 2018, I wanna say, um, and it was an amazing moment. I was on the Belhar Commission committee, the small committee that was small, 50 people in the committee, but uh, who uh, monitored that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, um, um, confession and, uh, and organized the presentations for it later to, to the uh, body. And I remember the uh, South African leader, uh, who's named, sort of uh, has disappeared my vocabulary right now, but I can picture him coming as a representative. Would it have, would it have been Alan Bosak by yeah, any chance? Bosak, yes, thank you. Uh, having him there uh, and uh, being there in the moment was 700, 800 people, commissioners and uh, singing uh, um, We Shall Overcome together was so special and of course, I happen to have my harmonica with me, and, uh, and which I often bring out <laughs> when she wants to sing, and uh, and sang and played that uh, and, and as we all came together in a, in a unity I have not experienced in so long around us, uh, the message of freedom, and of course the Palestinian uh, Esmond Tutu, uh, who talked about the Palestinian situation, said that uh, this occupation is the worst thing, even far worse than what we experienced in South Africa. You know, that, that provides a wonderful segue to the next question I wanted to ask you, Bill. It's, it's kind of a long question, so hang with me here. Uh, you know, Amnesty International just came out with this scathing indictment of uh, Israel's apartheid. And they follow, of course, Human Rights Watch, uh, Yesh Dean, and B'Tselem, both Israeli organizations, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Pal Kairos Palestine's Cry for Hope in calling this apartheid. So now I wanna, tr I wanna translate that back into your book. In October of 2008, uh, 2013, you're in Atlanta with Daoud to speak at Emory University. You say that you've been struggling for years to capture and you use the words of Jeff Halper, how to capture Israel's matrix of control. And you did that by writing The Puppeteer. And this is how The Puppeteer, your poem ends. So let me read, let me read how it ends. 
How long, O oh puppeteer, can you control the hearts, minds, and bodies of those innocent souls who pay double for their water? Move only when permitted and build only for it to be demolished. The answer, of course, is known by a few who rise up in anger, call out in rage too, and demand to be free. All children of God who, deep down, seek harmony. The puppeteer. So, um, this 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 sense this growing sense of apartheid that you had as you traveled back and back and back again, and now people are starting to say that word out loud. Talk to us about that. Ah, uh, yes. Um... The, uh, for many years, the word apartheid was one of those emotive words that separated people. Um, and and um, I think my mission, my mission, as I look back, you know, we all look at the threads of our life and we see patterns and wish maybe we had known that years before, right? But then the journey would have been useless, right? So, but I, I, I think that uh, that was the lens that I took into situations wherever I was that, that matured and developed over the years uh, of looking at what my mother said, one of two things, being kind was something you could always do, Bill. And the other was, what, what is it that makes people tick? Why do people believe what they believe? And so um, as an educator, um, I found the most fruitful times of teaching was in discovery moments when my students um, understood history or experiences um, as, um, uh, I was losing the thought there, as, but they discovered on their own their understanding of reality, yes, and helping them shape that, not presented to it, helping them be a part of it. I think I carried that off in my teaching uh, in, in, in workshops and, and, and so forth and speeches and writing. So I approached it in, in 2010, probably. Uh, I thought there were more important priorities like the boycotts and the, of, of, of when it's produced in, the, in Israel um, are, are the, uh, the sanctions movement. And uh, though the Interfaith Peace Builders was a, not the Interfaith Peace Builders, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network was a, 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 an initiator of that movement uh, nationwide and uh, had re-entered uh, the, the resolution for apartheid, Israel as a apartheid state early on, um, even before 2012, and still are, I think, this moment in time for this coming General Assembly. Um, yeah, I, so when I was teaching, I had to be careful. I had to think about who my audience was. And to use emotive words earlier on separated us. So I had to find ways to do that. And one of those was through that poem that you read a part of. Yeah. Uh, and it, because it was my voice, it wasn't someone that I handed down a message that I handed down. It was something that was coming from within me. You know, your question. You know, thank you. You know, just this last summer, the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network presented a resolution that the UCC passed with 85% of the vote that called Israel's oppression of Palestinians apartheid. And that was a landmark resolution. I have another poem I want to read to you. I just have a handful of questions left. I mean, we could talk for another hour or two, but. Uh, um, I want to read to you something you wrote and ask you to tell us about how you came to write it. In fact, there's an excerpt of this poem on the back cover of your book. Walls, lines, fences, borders, all projects of separation, not communications, nor love, nor reconciliation. Lie, surrounding our vision with distinction deeply embedded by history. Walls, lines, fences, borders, might crumble, melt, and disappear like other human fabrications. Maybe. Tell us about that poem. 
Yes, uh, on that first trip with some of you in 2006, um, coming in late in the evening in Ben Gurion Airport and then driving from there to Jerusalem where we were gonna be staying overnight. Um, I saw glimpses as I got closer to the city of lines of cars uh, getting into the district, uh, certainly on a, proportion, a large proportion of them barely moving. Seeing soldiers for the first time since, oh, I can't remember when, but uh, getting a sense of, of, of military and, and that kind of thing. And uh, went to bed exhausted as you probably were the first day or two when you were adjusting, adapting to uh, new time zones. And uh, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning and uh, to the, the call of prayer as you know, it's such a wonderful, feeling and spirit in that. Um, and uh, I, I sat down and wrote in 20 minutes this poem called Walls, Lines, Fences, and Borders. At least that was the refrain. And uh, read it to the delegation that was there with me, the other members of the delegation, um, as a witness to what I had seen. Um, I have three more questions for you, Bill. Sure. Um, it's another poem that you wrote. <clears throat> you referred to this earlier, though, and any of us who have traveled with you or who know you know that you call your harmonica your harp, your constant companion. You say that, quote, its role is to lift up the voices of others in the chorus. And you wrote a poem about it called Dancing Between the Spaces. And let me read part of the poem to you. Sure. The harp's voice is sweet and harmonious as it dances between notes and enhances other voices. This musician is called to be melodiously here and there, and God dances between the spaces. Tell us about your harp mm -hmm. and how it enhances the other voices in the chorus. Well, gosh, I don't know. It's something magical about a harp, not necessarily the way I play it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I I I, I it, it was a good friend of mine uh, for many years. Uh, you still uh, play? Do you still uh, play? Yeah, I played in a rock and roll band uh, at Trinity for a while. <laughs> uh, sort of missed that. Now um, we're in Peachtree City, Georgia, but I've uh, so I've done what I did when I was. In Presbytery, I was my, my job. What I tried to do was to visit 105 churches in our Presbytery during my term, and I'd take my harp with me. I'd certainly clear this with the pastor beforehand. I, I would ask her or him uh, if I could uh, if I could join them in worship. And so, when there was a piece that I thought needed a harmonica, I would bring it out, and people would look at me and wonder. <laughs> what is this, this person? Uh, and, and, and most people said, you know, it really fit quite well. And uh, it was a way of introducing one another. Uh, I first used it uh, in a travel to Kenya years ago, it was at St. Andrew's Church there, the largest church in Nairobi. And uh, we walked in, Jim Atwood was leading a group then, and any of you know Jim uh, and the work he did. And, Gun violence, and um, there were uh, 600 uh, children and their parents in this beautiful hall, and we were the only white folk there in the back row. And I, as I always do, I carried my harmonica and played a song that I had done at my church uh, with the contemporary band that we had. And I played with it, and immediately the people in the first two rows turned around with smiles, and it was a way of connecting with the <laughs> entire group. It was fun. So I, I used it a lot in my classes when I was teaching music as a, a way of studying history and learning about uh, uh, our past. But uh, it's been a gift to me, and I, uh, it's right beside me all the time. And I, I carry usually a full octave when I go to church, never knowing <laughs> what the key is going to be. <laughs> So far, yeah. I haven't had anybody throw anything at me. But uh, at the end, at, at the end of the, your book, uh, Bill, you offer a simulation game whose purpose is to understand the impact of the occupation on various people in the West Bank. And you also related 
uh, to me about a recent meeting with a member of your new church in Atlanta who read your book. And the first thing he said to you was, I never knew, like the title of your book, reflecting, you know, reflecting your title. So I know it's only been out a short while, uh, this book of yours, but tell us about the reactions you received and, and how it might be used how, and how you're hoping it'll be used. Yes, I, I wrote, or I, I thought I said at the beginning of our time together that um, what I hope would be the outcome of this meeting is that you would be in touch with your stories because those are the, the uh, really important messages of, of our conversation. They, the uh, authenticity is the word on it. The authenticity of your story and, and its meaning for others. People, so, have been sending, people have been sending their stories to you. Yeah, yes, they have from the far away as uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and so I'm keeping them uh, for whatever reason. But I've found connections in our stories but all, because they all seem to be focused on, on good news. And, and I, I think we need to develop a new reality in our society. It's not focused on the Lord of the Flies, but on something much more. Uh, hopeful and, and reactive. People have been mention, asking on uh, in the chat about how to get your book. You can get it on Amazon, can you not? Yes, you can. The yeah. Stories I Never Knew, uh, William Plitt, 2021 on Amazon. Hey, Bill, I've got, uh, I've got one last question for you, man. Um, by the way, just uh, before we ask the last question and draw to a close, I want you to know that Indiana Center for Middle East Peace is recording uh, this uh, conversation between Bill and myself, and we'll be translating it into a YouTube, and then I'll be sending Bill a copy, as well as the uh, co-sponsors and sponsors. Uh, and again, we wanna thank our sponsors, uh, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, Israel-Palestine Mission Network, Friends of Ten of Nations North America, Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, our co-sponsors, Center for Jewish Nonviolence, Jewish Voice for Peace Atlanta, the Olive Oil Ministry, United Church of Christ, Palestine Israel Network, ICAD USA, United Methodist Kairos Response, Voices from the Holy Land, and In His Steps, Pathways of Peace. We'll be sharing the recording, the YouTube recording with every one of those organizations or you can get it from our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace um, uh, I, uh, uh, YouTube channel. Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel. Okay, with that commercial out of the way, Bill. Um, you know, there's, there's Bill Plitt, the churchman, Bill Plitt, the activist, Bill Plitt, the peacemaker, and there's Bill Plitt, uh, the teacher, and then there's Bill Plitt, the man. And uh, I want to just share a story that I read about you and, and have you talk about it. I found a July 31st, 2021 short piece you wrote for, we talked about him earlier, Larry Cuban, about your Cordoza teaching experience. But in, in, that, in that essay, you reference a book that you say you've used, quote, with hundreds of church and school settings, nearly every class of high school students, as well as every teacher group since 1987. I'll Love You Forever by Robert Munch. What is it about that book? Give us a, give us a, a window into the heart of Bill Plitt, the man, as we close up today. Uh, what is it about that book that inspires you to share it so widely with all, this, all these various people? I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Tell us about the book, Bill, and why it touches you. I love you forever. I like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. That, that's the tune I put to the verses, that, or the story that many of us use. Uh, and... Uh, it's really a story for all generations. I'm seeing a lot of you sort of nod your head saying, I know the story. And uh, because uh, uh, I've used in, in my work in, in Mexico, in Mexican villages of, with just women in the, 
and uh, it's a story that all people can relate to. And I had it with me, had the book with me when I went to Tent of Nations the first time. And um, Bishara, who's now 16, we're going on 17 now, that was a youngest son, uh, only son. Um, and I read it to him in that cold night along the fire. Uh, and I have a picture on my wall somewhere of that time. Um, I wrote Robert Munch uh, some years later because I used to use it in workshops with 200 or more teachers uh, in, in churches. A uh, simple message, and there's certainly, for those of you who know the story, know there's usually not a dry eye uh, in, in the audience when, when it's over, regardless of who you are. And I wrote Robert Munch, the author, uh, years later, and I said, you know, thank you for this book. I've used it with thousands of people, <laughs> hundreds of people. And uh, he said, you know, Bill, I, I never thought that that would be a, a book. It was always just a story. And the first year uh, we sold a million copies and, uh, and the editor or publisher said, it was just an anomaly, it'll never happen again. He said for the next seven years, they, should, they, they sold a thousand copies. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a way of connecting one another in what I call humankind. You know, I believe fervently that uh, most of us want good. And uh, I just encourage us all to keep that in mind, to look for the good in things that, uh, that give us hope. Bill, I'm gonna ask you to center your camera uh, on your face. Uh, if you could screw it, there you go. And I'm gonna just, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a chance for a closing word. But I just want to say thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your work with Friends of Tented Nations North America. Thank you for your work with Israel Palestine Mission Network. For all these various organizations uh, whose work you touched, and for each one of our lives that you've touched in some uh, big and small ways, but you've touched our lives very much with your sense of justice, but also with your humility and your openness to these unanticipated possibilities. So on behalf of everyone here who are your friends, uh, I want to say thank you to you. And do you have any closing thoughts? Mm, closing thoughts. I hope to see you all soon again. <laughs> and maybe <laughs> at the Tent of Nations, or maybe in the streets of George, George, uh, Georgia, here at Peachtree City. Um, I, I've, I've, I'm, look, I'm looking at one screen. I wish I could look at all of them because I see people who have meant so much to me. Many of you have walked alongside me, uh, some ahead of me, but a lot of you behind me nudging. So keep on nudging because I'm, uh, I'm open for more surprises. I'm not done yet, as uh, Dawood said this morning. You're not finished yet. <laughs> and you're not finished. We've got a lot of work to do this year. Thank you all for coming and being here. It's so special. And thank you, Bill. And it's, it's, it, it inspires us to know that you're not done yet. And so we're, uh, we're walking this road together. Thank you, Mike. Lord, everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of Bill, I want to say thanks to all of you. And I want to say thanks to our sponsoring and co-sponsoring organizations.